Hi, I'm Dad the Engineer. Quite a bit of my recent content has mentioned internet routers. I explained concepts without first explaining what a router is and what it does. Oops. I'm going to fix that in a few seconds. Before I get to that, I'm going to ask you to like this video and subscribe to my channel. It would help me a lot and I would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you hear strange sounds, you should know that I'm currently surrounded by four of the six dogs in my house. Most of you are aware that you have a router and that it might be the box that your internet connection is attached to. It could be a router, or it might be a media converter like a modem, or it might be both. You see, a device is said to be a router if it can pass data back and forth between the devices on your local area network, or LAN, and another network, usually the internet. In the early days of internet connected computers, this wasn't really a thing. If you were on a LAN, you could access external data with proxies. If you wanted internet access, you'd typically have an external IP address. Given the need for computers to access both local and external resources, and considering the limitations of IPv4 addressing, it was clear that a new solution was required. That solution is called Network Address Translation, or NAT. NAT allows multiple devices on the LAN to use a single external IP address. The router does this by maintaining a table of connections. Generally, these connections are established by devices on your LAN. The router creates the connection on behalf of the internal device, and data that's returned externally gets forwarded onto the internal device. There is a measure of protection here because the only externally visible device is your router. If the router receives traffic that doesn't correspond to an entry in its connection table, nothing is sent to any of the devices on the LAN. Generally, that puts the pressure on securing your router, as that's going to be an attractive target to gain access to your LAN. That works great if you're trying to access the internet from inside your LAN. But what if you need to access the LAN from the internet? Great examples would be if you wanted to host your own website or email server. In those cases, connections need to be established on demand from outside the LAN. For that, there are some common ways to route unsolicited traffic from the internet to devices on your LAN. The first would be port mapping. Port mapping allows for data to be sent to a single port, a range of ports, or all ports on an external IP to be forwarded to a device on the LAN. Decent routers also allow for source or outbound NAT to rewrite the source IP address when port forwarding. Port triggering and DMZs are other mechanisms allowing for externally initiated connections to make it into your network, but those are outside the scope of this video. A small router only needs to do NAT. Basic routing, though, is very easy, not requiring any type of substantial hardware. Because of this, other functionality is often packed in, even with basic routers. Here are some add-ons you'll commonly see. A DHCP server. In order to do almost anything useful on a network with a device, it requires an IP address. While IP addresses can be manually assigned, it's much more common to see them dynamically assigned using Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. When using DHCP, a device on the network will discover and contact the DHCP server and receive an IP address lease. This lease has some duration after which it can expire and the IP address will return to the server's pool. Most home users utilize the DHCP server on their router. Aside from being convenient, this arrangement also ensures that the gateway, DNS servers, subnet mask, and other networking properties for the local IP address are correct. Without DHCP, most home users would struggle to set up their LAN. If you ever see that a device has a 169.whatever.whatever.whatever address, that means that the client was either not able to find the DHCP server or that it was not able to obtain a lease, usually because the server is out of IP addresses in the lease range or because the device is blocked. A firewall. It's common for the terms router and firewall to be used interchangeably. That's understandable as the two are often found together, but they are different things serving different purposes. Firewalls range from dumb to smart, generally corresponding to simple to deeply layered solutions. The most basic of firewalls control incoming and outgoing network traffic based on a set of security rules. It starts with blocking certain IP addresses, ports, and protocols, progressively getting more sophisticated. More advanced features would be intrusion detection and protection, DDoS identification, access control policies, and detecting malicious activity. The best firewalls perform deep packet inspection, making decisions based not only on traffic properties, but on the data carried within the traffic as well. It's here also that you'll see firewalls operating outside of OSI Layer 3, with an understanding of specific data within the application layer. 
like reading email content or looking at HTTP requests. The more you ask a firewall to do, the more it may struggle to run on a router platform that didn't account for high processing requirements. Most disposable routers either don't have meaningful firewall capabilities or don't have the resources to run significant firewall functionality without massively impacting the throughput of traffic going through the router firewall. Traffic shaping and QoS. Internet connectivity bandwidth is typically a shared resource between multiple programs on the same device and between multiple users on different devices. Without any context, the router will assume that all traffic is equal, but it's usually not. For example, all traffic from my work laptop should be prioritized since I work from home. I shouldn't have call instability in Teams because one of my daughters is downloading something huge on Steam. Similarly, streaming video on the living room TV shouldn't impede my daughter's online school assignments. Traffic shaping, and to some degree QoS, meaning quality of service, are mechanisms for prioritizing traffic by device or protocol, and even setting speed limits for device or protocol traffic with different rules for each direction. This is not difficult to set up, but it is common to have misunderstandings and make mistakes. A common misconception is that traffic shaping makes things faster. It might, but it's really more about creating rules by which the bandwidth is used. More often than not, a well-tuned setup will actually be slightly slower, but the clients and services that you care about will have a more predictable bandwidth and latency experience. Parental controls. I think of parental controls as a specialized set of firewall rules. It can be more than that though, as these controls don't conform to any standard, so they range from basic to comprehensive. They may block inappropriate content, set usage limits, and set access times. Depending on how they're implemented, parental controls may also be hilariously easy to defeat. Keeping that in mind, if you plan on relying on parental controls, you should research the specific implementation before committing to the solution. VPN Client If you've heard of VPNs at all, you're probably thinking about a VPN client. A VPN client allows you to connect to a VPN server. In the context of a router, that can mean two things. One use of this functionality is to connect to a third-party VPN service, like NordVPN, in order for all of your traffic to be obfuscated from your internet service provider. Now that secure HTTP is pretty much standard, this is less of an issue than it used to be. Sending your data through a VPN decreases your throughput and increases your latency, but make sure that all of your LAN devices have their transmitted data hidden, assuming your VPN server provider doesn't log your traffic. Another use of this functionality is to connect your network to another private network. This is common for attaching remote workers to company LANs, especially when they have non-PC devices like IP phones. VPN traffic is encrypted both directions, and this can be very processing intensive at high connection speeds. Not every device that offers this feature will be able to run it at line speed. VPN server. VPN servers are interesting because they allow you to connect to your home LAN when off-site or on the go. I use a VPN server to decrease my reliance on cloud-based storage, pretty much always having access to my PC servers and NAS units. A VPN server's resource requirements are largely dependent on the client count and connection speeds. Due to the processing requirements associated with encryption, disposable routers tend to struggle with this particular workload, especially at fast connection speeds. Dynamic DNS. Most residential internet connectivity has external IP addresses issued through DHCP. Generally speaking, routers will renew the lease over and over, retaining that same IP address for weeks, months, or years. The thing is that that's not guaranteed, though. Your IP address can change pretty much whenever. Most people won't know or care, but you have to know your external IP address if you're connecting in from the outside, like to use the VPN server. Dynamic DNS allows you to specify a fully qualified host name instead of an IP address, and the dynamic DNS client on the router will keep the IP address updated on the DNS record. There are other ways to do dynamic DNS, but this kind of implementation is convenient since your router is on all the time and is aware of when a DHCP lease expires. USB-based expansion. USB peripherals stray pretty far from the idea of a basic router firewall combo, but they're low-hanging fruit. After all, a router is usually a stripped-down single-board PC running a stripped-down operating system. Including and utilizing a USB port is pretty much a throw-in. Normally, you can attach devices like printers, storage, or even a cellular modem. In the case of a printer, it can turn a USB printer into a network printer. Mounted storage can be used as a mini NAS that's a shared or backup drive, sometimes even with transcoded media streaming. 
Some routers can use a USB cellular modem as a backup connection in a multi-WAN setup. I have a video on multi-WAN connectivity if you're interested. The link is in the top right and in the video description below. If you're thinking that I've left out wireless connectivity, it's on purpose. Wi-Fi and the authentication and encryption that go along with it aren't really router features. Sure, I included the USB port, but that's more because many people don't know what it's for. If you feel like I left out something that people should really know about, please let me know in the comments below. If you haven't seen my video on why you may need to throw away your router, you should probably check it out. It's at the top right and linked in the video description below. If you're using equipment provided by your internet service provider, you should find out if you have the performance and safety that you're expecting. I'm noticing that my videos are getting longer. Is that okay? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know what features you can't live without on your router. As a final note, this video is really only about your router. It's worth mentioning that your internet traffic ends up being touched by multiple routers. That work is much more interesting as those routers manage how traffic is sent when multiple paths are available. The factors include route status, like if the route is working or not, the speed of the route option from one point to another, and the cost of sending data down one path versus others. Amazing stuff. If you found this video to be helpful and would like to see more like it, please like and subscribe. I'm just getting this thing started and I could really use your help. If you would like to contribute some feedback, please engage with me in the comments below. Thanks, and have an awesome day.